Let me talk to you a little bit about um, how I see the, the issues of transnational organized crime. And, um, uh, and I, know, I know you have my bio, but most recently I was at the Department of Defense where, as, as, you, as, uh, as was mentioned, I did special operations in combating terrorism. Before that, I was the DASD for counter-narcotics and global threats. So I looked at, from the Pentagon's perspective, um, these issues of these non-state threat networks from both the, uh, the the places where the Department of Defense has the finish and the places where the Department of Defense is the supporting element uh, to civilian agencies. And I've also worked on these similar issues uh, f uh, from a previous tour at the National Security Council, where I was Director of, Nas of Transnational Threats, working on uh, crime and terrorism and drugs, and also at the Department of the Treasury, where, um, where I worked on these issues for the Secretary Secretary of the Treasury to build out the sanctioning and anti-money laundering um, efforts uh, way back in the day. So um, the one, the, the first thing which is important for for everyone here is you know this issue is about as uh, as much of an interagency issue as any issue that exists um, in the in the panoply of, of policy issues that confront the U.S. government. Can everyone hear me fine, or is it okay? Um, and. Uh, uh, and it's a very important issue. So let me just talk a little bit about it. I'm going to talk about, you know, a little bit of uh, uh, thematically, structurally, how I see the issue, uh, and a little bit of then about what needs to be done and how we should approach this issue. All with a focus, of course, on Africa because that's where uh, that's where we want to talk about it. And then I'm going to spend just a little bit of time talking about what the Department of Defense's role is really in this because we have so many people here from the Department of Defense because I was last at the Department of Defense because we're of course with the Department of Defense um, Center. But um, after that, I'm going to try to keep that short and let's make this more of a conversation because this this uh, this is such. A, such a small room, small group. Um, when we when we look at uh, transnational organized crime, you know, this is always a problem in every country in the world. Um, it is sometimes a national security threat for those countries. Uh, it has times in our own history been a national security threat in the United States. Um, and sometimes those national security threats to those own to, to countries abroad, uh, also present national security threats to the United States. And that's, uh, and, and we have different interests in each one of those things. Sometimes we, we have interest in just helping countries deal with their own problems, but we have real interest in helping them deal with their national security threats, and we have very significant interest when it's our national security threats. So let's talk a little bit about what those, what those are uh, and, and why those are problems. Um, it's a problem both directly and indirectly. Directly, transnational organized crime can uh, fundamentally deny a foreign government um, its role as the sole uh, uh, user of force within that country. That there's another actor that, uh, that uses force and sometimes is seen as very legitimately as using force in those countries. And that's a, that's a first-order uh, role for, the, for government. Um, and transnational organized crime is quite often, uh, more often I would argue than insurgencies, the, the, a challenge to that role of government. Um, it, it, it more basically denies government, the legitimate government, even physical access uh, to areas of the country, to, to borders of the country, um, which presents a whole other range of direct problems. And then, very directly, it cooperates, coordinates, facilitates, finances other direct threats, most notably terrorism. Um, those are direct. Those are amongst the direct threats from transnational organized crime all around the world, and Africa is um, is encounter and many places in Africa are encountering those right now. Um, and then there are the indirect uh, uh, threats from transnational organized crime. Um, it corrupts government. It corrupts the legal system. It corrupts the the culture in uh, in countries. It it encourages a, a culture of bribery and self dealing. Which uh, uh, which has long term uh, uh, devastating effects um, towards countries. Um, it as a, as a result, it prevents and and really hinders legitimate economic development uh, in so many countries, um, and it uh, hinders direct immediately foreign direct investment by increasing financial risks. Um, in my uh, uh, in my spare time. I work, I'm, uh, I'm a vice chairman of a, of a finance, of a merchant bank, um, and I can tell you this is, it is routine that it comes up, um, and, I do, and we do projects in Africa 
where investors just immediately say, absolutely not. You know, there's no way that I'm going to go there. And crime is a big part of it. And the culture of corruption and self-dealing that's around that is a big part of it. I was, uh, I mean, just, just last month I was dealing with uh, a, a billionaire in the United States up in New York who I really thought was going to be interested and he just completely dismissed um, a very significant project in West Africa uh, for, these, for these reasons. Don't even want to look at it. Um, and that's the, the real world impact for these, uh, for, uh, as a result of these problems. Um, the uh, uh, Crime and, and uh, is is driven by top down and is also internally driven. Um, it can be top down because the culture of criminality is led and modeled by those in power. That happens um, far too often in the history of Africa and even today in Africa. It can also be bottom up as I understand with long standing cultural norms or subcultural norms, tribal norms. Um, there's usually deep socioeconomic and political incentives that, that drive these. These are not um, easily solved, but they need to be understood at, when analyzing um, the issue. Um, the, uh, and as I said before, it's internally driven, it can be externally driven. It, the Internally driven because the demand for the criminal uh, acts, for the products that crime produce, um, that there's a, there's, a, there's a domestic market for that, and there are some countries in Africa that that's really what's driving it. But it can also be externally driven, where the demand is foreign. And the country in question had, had very, very little to do with the fact that it becomes a transit point for a significant amount of movements of illicit cargo and, uh, and finance for um, uh, that has very destabilizing effects because the demand is elsewhere. Um, this can either because, be because uh, uh, of resources within the country that are demanded uh, elsewhere and the, the, the common resource curse that I'm sure you all uh, know about that many countries in Africa suffer from. Um, and by the way, the United States suffers from. If you look at the history of the United States and you look at where some of the largest amounts of corruption were in the United States, it is happens to overlap a lot where there are where there are resources in the ground that can be extracted. Um, so this is this is a this is not an Africa specific issue. This is a uh, this is a global this is a human nature um, issue. If there's something really valuable that you can pluck out of the ground, the people that have political power over that over that thing that you can take out of the ground tend to want to um, uh, get personal uh, benefit um, from that. Um, the, uh, it takes a particularly powerful individual culture to, to, uh, and, and legal structures to, uh, to push against that, that dynamic. Um, but, it's, uh, 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 but it's also when I said criminal demand is from elsewhere. So the most you know, powerful example of that right now um, is, uh, is the recent uptick uh, from the most recent UN uh, uh, ODC report about cocaine uh, coming from uh, the Western Hemisphere uh, to meet demand in Europe in Western Europe. Um, unfortunately, for countries in West Africa, they're on the way. They didn't do anything about the demand. <laughs> they didn't do anything about the creation of the, of the cocaine, but the transit routes that, um, that feed a lot of this cocaine into Europe happen to go through a lot of places in West Africa. Um, and, uh, and that's a real problem. And it's a, it can come, the problem can be compounded in those situations because it's a, 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 a typical reaction that we see all around the world is when that happens, people say it's not our fault. So why do I have to deal with it? And then on top of it, it doesn't really harm me because we're just a transit country. I don't know one transit country that hasn't had ended up with a huge drug problem um, of its own or a huge corruption problem. Uh, whether it was the Caribbean in the 1990s, whether you know, there's 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 countless there's countless examples. And unfortunately, what it tends to do is it tends to delay a government's effective response when that dynamic applies because they say it's not my fault, so I don't have to, I don't have, it's not really harming me, so I don't have to deal with it. Um, the, uh, I'm happy to talk more about that as, as well. Um, uh, the same thing, by the way, for ivory, um, you know, and uh, the same thing for the, uh, for the smuggling of people, and the same thing for methamphetamine and heroin, which is actually going to the United States from Africa um, in such a way. So, you know, in the big picture, what do we do about this? You have to do demand reduction efforts all around the world, especially in all the rich countries, including the United States, that, that dominate the demand for, uh, uh, for most criminal uh, goods um, that are produced around the world. Um, 
that's that's a long term effort. You know, there's also similarly within the countries themselves in Africa, long term efforts on development and technical assistance and improvements in uh, in institutions and infrastructure, and all of that is very critical. We have people from USAID and, and others about how we how we do that. But if that's all we do um, for uh, uh, in this area, we we are really missing um, uh, what. Uh, what the what the U.S. government's role is, particularly in places where the criminal efforts have have risen to the level where it's a national security threat to a country that we are friendly with, or even more so when the when when the criminal uh, dynamic has risen to the level where it's a national security threat to the United States, and then we then we have a real issue, we have a real effort, and frankly we can't rely only on these long term efforts. Doesn't mean you shouldn't be doing these long term efforts. But they can't only be what we're doing. Um, and quite frankly, when it comes to Africa in particular, for most of ours, that's that's what we have been doing, are just these, these long-term efforts. Um, and, uh, and we've suffered for it in our own national security interests. I can talk about that a lot. Let me take it one step back, though, um, uh, about uh, how to think about this issue more, more generally. Um, First and foremost, and, and the word convergence um, has been used. It's probably in the Prism uh, book uh, a lot recently, and that's and that is the intellectual structure that we that we've talked about a lot in government over the last decade of the criminal uh, uh, enterprises, the terrorist groups, um, the uh, insurgencies. Um, all of these efforts are coming together in a variety of different ways. Some of them, it's the same organization. Some of it's organizations working with each other. Uh, some of it is using the same roots and the and overlappings in personnel. But we're well past the day, the time when intellectually, we c if we ever could, um, we could say, okay, let me look at criminal groups in one in one area. And you guys are in the National Intelligence, you know, you're in the National Intelligence Council, and you know, terrorist groups in another area, and insurgency groups in another area, and even and even you know, elements of states in some cases in another area. These all um, uh, affect each other in some cases are the same same people, um, and and this has been going on for a long time. I mean, one one thing that I like to point out is that way in 1907, uh, there was a stagecoach robbery. Just the same kind of stagecoach robbery that you see in old westerns. Uh, it was a stagecoach that belonged to a bank. It was holding a lot of uh, gold and, and money. And uh, people came out, you know, things over their face with guns, robbed it, took a, took a, took a lot of money. It was, it was quite a successful one. Why I'm mentioning it is because it was in uh, Tbilisi, and the leader of the gang that was doing this robbery was Joseph Stalin. And he was doing on behest of Vladimir Lenin. And they used that money at, a quite, at an important time to help the Bolshevik party have the resources that it needed to eventually accomplish what it wanted to accomplish. The notion that there's a convergence that groups that use criminal enterprises for political, ideological, insurgency, terrorist uh, uh, objectives is not new. This has been going on for, for a long time. Um, but again, I would say that our own U.S. government, you know, inside this room, the, our analytical framework has often missed that point. Um, I remember when, uh, just as an example, I remember when Yasser Arafat died. Um, uh, I could not get a uh, a, um, a a proper analysis of why he was a billionaire. Where that money came from, where it went, and where it was going. This this is a guy that was, you know, the center of a lot of U.S. foreign policy for a long period of time, and we didn't we didn't have the understanding of all the networks um, that uh, that that underlined the legitimate sources of his revenues and the illegitimate sources of of his revenues. Um, so, um, uh, so the first order thing is to, to have us really think, think these things through and think in new ways. And that what's very nice is we've come an awful long way as a government, and now you see uh, these kinds of connections very, very well understood. Um, it's also important to look at how we are thinking of terrorism has evolved and its relation to the, all of this. What I, you know, I, I'd like to talk about before is sort of terrorism 1.0, 2.0, and 3.0 in terms of their revenues. And again, 
it's a little bit of a simplification because you can go to lots of different groups at different times and, and categorize them in different ways. But when you talk about how the U.S. government at the highest level sort of thinks about these things, my observation is that you know terrorism 1.0 was the way that we really tended to think about it in the 80s and the, and the 90s, where um, when we thought about how do terrorists get the money that they need to do their operations, it was state sponsorship. And all of our policy, almost all of our policy efforts, almost all of the tools that we used were all about dealing with state sponsors of terrorism and they are willingly giving money to, to terrorists. And that still exists, of course. Uh, Iran does that. You know, other countries in the world uh, 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 do this. Um, so that hasn't gone away. But then with Al Qaeda, we got a, um, a terrorism 2.0, um, which was uh, they didn't need state sponsorship. Um, they what to, in order to finance what they were doing, they had a, a giant glo regional and global network of willing financiers, willing donors that were giving to they were get, that supported what they were doing ideo ideologically, that supported what um, they were doing practically, supported what they were doing for humanitarian purposes in some cases, and were giving them uh, giving them money. And that's you know, and that's why Bin Laden became uh, and Al Qaeda became what they were, not because Bin Laden was a great uh, warrior, which is normally the way that people become heads of terrorist organizations, because he was a great financier. I mean, it's 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 really an amazing story uh, when you when you think about it that a that a financier becomes the head of of an organization because he could provide resources um, that were not dependent on states. And then you get terrorism 3.0, which says uh, we don't even look to necessarily to willing and witting donors. Uh, we look to our own sources of revenue that we as a terrorist group create on the ground. Um, and that is because quite often we, uh, uh, we own territory, we tax, we uh, work with criminal networks, we are criminal networks ourselves um, in many cases. Uh, and anything that moves in that area, we're sort of sup we're, we're replacing the state as being the, uh, the driver of resources from those things that move. And the, Islam and the Islamic State is sort of most preeminent in that model. But it's not the only one in that model at all. Um, and that is a very, very different way to understand how these kinds of organizations, whether they're terrorist groups or whether they're insurgencies, um, operate. And it's a very different way to think about how criminal activity affects national security. Um, you know, again, when uh, uh, just in the last administration in which I served, um, we had been in Afghanistan for uh, for for you know for eight years at that point, and we still did not have an, uh, an appropriate understanding of how the Taliban was resourced in order to fight a war against us. And uh, Richard, you know, late great Richard Holbrook, you know, spoke publicly about how. Uh, they were getting a lot of money through winning donors in the Middle East and everything, and he was very much in a 2.0 mindset, as I was saying. And that's true to, an, to a degree, but that's not how the Taliban was getting the risk. Taliban was a 3.0 organization. Taliban was getting a huge amount of their resources. Uh, uh, the, the, they were getting resources from foreign governments. They were getting resources from willing donors, but they're getting the vast majority of the resources from the areas in which they operated. And the number one revenue source in those areas uh, was the drug trade. Uh, it's a majority of Afghanistan's uh, GDP in, uh, uh, in, in some analyses. Um, but it wasn't just that. It was literally everything. From uh, uh, from uh, from energy to uh, to the phone system to to everything that you can, they were they were get to our own by the way um, uh, contracts and transportation, uh, which in some regions of Afghanistan was the number one source of Taliban financing was the U.S. government. So if you understand it that way, then you get a very very different picture of the adversary that you're that you're confronting that is threatening U.S. national security interests. Um, the, uh, uh, let me talk about, um, uh, uh, and then there are, there are other types of crime as well. You know, again, all kinds of smuggling of weapons, of poaching, of commissit, of, of illicit commodities, of, of legal commodities. Um, the, uh, uh, the, um, and kidnapping for ransom is a huge, uh, uh, uh money source. And this is, this is a problem that 
we still have, do not have a unified Western approach to where some countries you have, you have, uh, some countries like, uh, like Russia, which has actually been very successful in many cases, including piracy and others, by just killing everybody brutally. And then you actually see things in the, in, in the, in the phone calls of people saying, oh, that, that thing has Cyrillic lettering on it. Don't go near there. You know, so that actually works. Immoral, but it works. Um, to the United States, which, which generally refuses to pay bribes, um, uh, and, uh, and we see real positive impact to that. To lots of countries in Western Europe, which pay bribes all the time, still. And a kidnapping for ransom just continues and continues and continues as you would, as you would expect once you've established that incentive system for, for criminal and terrorist organizations. Um, as an example of the, uh, of the global interconnection of all of this, I, th I want to talk a little bit about a story about Lebanese Canadian banks. Anyone, does that ring a bell to anybody, just by the way, that, that one bank? No? Okay. So this happened about five years ago, uh, six years ago. And, and, and let me tell you the story more. The, the story in general was that uh, drug traffickers in um, Latin America, uh, particularly in Colombia, uh, Peru, uh, that area, um, had, a, had a lot of money and they needed to launder it. And they were, they were trying to find out new ways to do this. And the mechanism that eventually was created um, had to do with shipping the money um, uh, uh, as well as the drugs and everything through West Africa. Um, the, the money was uh, intermixed with another criminal effort that those, nar that those narco traffickers didn't have anything to do with, but they partnered with. It was actually driven out of uh, the United States for about stolen cars and even some legitimately bought used cars that were all sent to West Africa. And you can see these wonderful satellite, shops, uh, satellite shots of millions of cars in Benin and elsewhere. Literally millions that are, that are part of this whole, whole effort. And I'm sure some of you guys drive, I mean, I remember driving around, uh, I think it was Sierra Leone with a car with a, right behind a car with a California license plate. You know, they didn't, you know, I mean, you know, the huge amount of cars going in there. But that was a whole different criminal exercise. Um, and by the way, some legitimate exercise again. So there was legitimate exports of cars to West Africa. Um, but, but the money from both of those were, were put together. They were put through Lebanese Canadian Bank, which was the fast at the time after the financial crisis. The Lebanese banking system was the fastest growing banking system in the world, which is kind of interesting because you wouldn't necessarily think that Beirut would be the be the be the place where safe money would want to go to. It might be the place where criminal money might want to go to, but uh, but it was at one point the fastest growing banking sector in the world, and Lebanese Canadian Bank was the fastest growing bank in that fastest growing banking sector. The money was then shipped to China to buy knockoff goods, counterfeit goods largely, which were then shipped to South America and sold. The money then going back to the, uh, having been laundered, going to the uh, criminal organizations both in the United States and in uh, South America. So you see a global network here across, uh, you know, the Western Hemisphere, across Africa, across the Middle East, across East Asia, um, multiple criminal organizations moving, uh, uh, co cooperating together, huge amounts of money being spent. Oh, and then here's the kicker for the whole thing. Who is getting a, a slice of all of this? Hezbollah, because they ran the bank, Lebanese Canadian Bank. Um, what happened at the end of the day was that the U.S. government uh, uh, did a uh, what's called a 311 action out of the Department of Treasury, identifying Lebanese Canadian Bank as a bank, a foreign bank of of uh, of, of significant money laundering concern. Um, that led to immediately that day a run on the bank. The next day, a forced sale at bargain prices to Societe Generale, who had to clean up the whole thing. And what was even more important for U.S. interests was the week after a whole flurry of public uh, op-ed uh, 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 columns in papers in uh, Beirut for bankers saying, 
yeah, we all knew when Hezbollah came into our banks and we all just turned a blind eye, but now we see it can destroy our banks. So why are we doing this? And that's what you want to see at the end of the day. Um, now, the other interesting story, and, I'll, and this will go to, go to something that I want to talk about next, um, is how did this all happen? The, the, the story that's not public is it is this all happened because the Drug Enforcement Administration was following a lot of uh, information on some specific cases that they were working on about drugs coming out of South America into the United States. And they kept seeing some of the money going elsewhere. And that was going towards Africa, towards the Middle East. And that was basically the end of what the Drug Enforcement Administration could do because they don't have a lot of, uh, of, of presence in those areas. They have some, but not, not a lot. Uh, what they did, did is they gave all the data to, uh, to the Department of Defense, to analysts, to say, you, can you guys do something on this? And a small team of people spent a couple of weeks and then came up with this whole picture which then was presented to the intelligence community, to the FBI, to, uh, uh, to the State Department, and eventually the Treasury Department, and they came up with, to, with, this, with this idea. Um, so the Department of Defense um, played a significant role in this effort, which on the face of it would have nothing to do with the Department of Defense. But what DEA was able to do was to figure out which one tool in the Department of Defense was useful and what that tool is, was the network analysis that has been honed to a quite significant capability uh, uh, in the context of our wars in, Afghan in, in Afghanistan and Iraq on counterterrorism. And it was those same tools that were analytical tools that were used in this case. So with that as an example, let me talk a little bit about how the U.S. and other countries, especially countries in Africa, combat these issues tactically. Again without in any way diminishing the long-term efforts that need to be done, both on the demand uh, reduction side and on the building of institutions, which is, which is, the, uh, which is critical for long-term success in this effort. But on the, but on the immediate term, when you're, when I, the, the first thing, and, and folks from, from law enforcement will, uh, uh, will recognize this, of course, is um, you need to start in any individual instance when once we've established that there's something that threatens the United States interests and we really want to be involved in it, is what is the theory of the case that we're talking about? And it seems like, that well, that's a pretty obvious thing to do, but quite often we, we are driven, uh, law enforcement cases especially, driven from the bottom up of an individual crime that's taking place. But when you're dealing with national security threats, you're going to be from the top down of what is the theory of the case of the threat that we are dealing with. And just asking it in that way and, and, and uh, tends to some, can sometimes get to completely different answers. So... Uh, going back, my, my favorite example along this is go back to the uh, mid to late 90s. I was at the White House at the National Security Council. I was, amongst other things, looking at Russian organized crime and how they were moving money and, and, and so forth. And my boss asked me to uh, look at Osama bin Laden, who, um, at the, who had not that long ago just gone from Sudan to Afghanistan, and to understand what the financial network was with very simple questions of how much money does he have? How does he get it? How does he move it? And what does he do with it? And when I asked that question, we briefed on it, the response that was given from the relatively few people in the government that, that, were, that were looking at it was saying that there's a lot of interesting questions about bin Laden, but that's not one of them. Because it's really simple, because he's a rich guy and it doesn't cost a lot to be a terrorist. Question answer. Question asked. Question answered. That's that's it. Like he can just you can just point out others. That was the view of the U.S. government at the time. But we got those very same people in a room and, and had them really think about it. And once they're thinking about what the theory of the case is, it was it, it came to a very very different thing. Was that he was at the head of a global network? In fact, the conclusion was he probably doesn't have much money himself at all. In fact, the 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 money whatever he got from his family is probably long gone if he ever got it in the first place. He's sitting on top of a financial network of continuous fundraising and continuous movement uh, through, through legitimate banks, but also through the informal Hawala system. Um, and that's just a very, very different theory of the case than what we, what we started on. And that offered up diff completely different solutions. 
to this because then we said, okay, well, where is he raising the money? And we had our very first conversations at the time with uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates about the fundraising that we saw in those countries at that time. Um, the uh, uh, so that's that's what we have to start with is the theory of the case, and I always encourage all of you, whenever you're we deal with these things, to to force the uh, if it hasn't happened already, to force the interagency to really consider that to understand what we are looking at and how it threatens U.S. national security interests. Then um, then you have operational uh, lessons that we've learned. The most important lesson that we've learned, again, this is not for the routine criminal investigations. This is for crime that is foreign, that affects U.S. national security interests, that uh, the most important thing operational would do is you need to cross bureaucracies, legal authorities, and the stovepipes that exist within our own government. Uh, we, so, we saw this in the, in the special operations community with what uh, Stan McChrystal uh, created uh, in Iraq. Uh, we've done it in Afghanistan, and we've seen it outside of war zones work as well. Um, this is this is quite different than the way that the system naturally works, and so in order to make it work, the best tool that we've uh, that we've come up with is to have a specific physical cell that is where, where people from different agencies are co-located. They're working together with an agreed upon uh, memorandum of understanding that says what we're all going to do and what we're talking. Everyone there from every different agency has a computer that connects them right back to their agency. So it's like they're not there in their agency and they can pull up all the information they need and they can work um, as a team to look at the uh, full ranges of tools <coughs> that exist. There are, there are a number of these kinds of organizations that exist for different purposes. Um, there are some that now uh, have, a, have, have decades worth of experience, like uh, Giant F South that focuses on the air traffic corridor between Latin America uh, and Florida and stop that, stop that problem. Um, there are ones specifically for war zones, and there are ones that are outside of war zones. This is not dissimilar to what law enforcement does domestically with, uh, with HIDAs or with terrorism task forces that the FBI leads, um, but, uh, uh, but it doesn't happen naturally abroad. Um, uh, it doesn't happen naturally even in the context of a country team. Um, that's working because this is much more operational work than what a country team typically does. There are some exceptions that I've seen, um, and uh, uh, and and uh, and as I mentioned, the most important thing is to use the full range of tools. This isn't um, about you know credit for the case. This is about uh, what tool is most appropriate in what instance. Um, uh, and as I mentioned before, the, the Department of Defense, a lot of the tools that it can bring are analytical. Um, then we get to, uh, and some of the key tools, I would say that some of the most important tools that the United States can offer other governments, in addition to uh, resources to, um, uh, uh, to provide training, to provide uh, uh, institutional development, to provide wider economic development, are the kinds of tools where we um, build up small units, uh, vetted surrogate units of our own. And by the way, whether that's a military unit uh, through special forces, whether that is a law enforcement unit through FBI or DEA, whether that's an intelligence unit that CIA uh, brings together, when we can work with a country and we can we can, over time, build up a small group of people that can be insulated from the wider corruption and problems around them that we can work with directly that can be our uh, agent um, within that country in effect. That really works very well. When we can have that, we can build up um, a wiretapping system. That works uh, really well. When we can apply our own laws extraterritorially. That's incredibly well, and sometimes that is about uh, if you if you ask um, uh, uh, President Uribe of Colombia what the number one decision he made uh, in to, that succeeded in turning the FARC from a country that from a, from an organization that owned all of Colombia in the in the late 1990s except for Bogota and owned Bogota at night. That's what the intelligence assessment was. Uh, and where I always remember this, in 1998, two-thirds of the Colombian population believed that the FARC was going to take Bogota and be the, be the government of their country. 
you know, two thirds of Afghans do not believe that the Taliban is going to take Kabul and be there. I mean, you know, Colombia was in a way, way worse situation there. And now the FARC is a shadow of what it was, and they're negoti and they've negotiated peace. Um, how did we get there? If you ask Uribe, there's a million things that 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 they did right, that we did right. But he would he would put top of the list the decision they made to start extraditing their criminals to the United States, and the willingness of the United States to take those criminals off their hands. Um, that's a huge step that most other countries won't take. But we get, but we, but we get to that point. Um, we want to get to that point eventually. But even so, there there are legal there are legal structures where, uh, if an American or an American company is involved, even tangentially, in a criminal activity abroad, you can bring charges inside the United States. Quite often, you get much greater cooperation from another government if it's about a criminal activity than if it's just about terrorism or or uh, or an insurgency. And then there are some things DEA has incredibly. Uh, uh, wide-ranging authorities, I, I, I learned, where even if there was no connection to a U.S. person or no connection to a U.S. bank or no drugs, any, you know, every, as long as the drug network does things that affect America, they can arrest um, uh, any, anybody and bring them to jail in the United States. There are Afghan uh, drug traffickers in U.S. jails right now <laughs> that, you know, had nothing to do with any, you know, personally with any drugs anywhere going to going to America. But that's the state of U.S. laws, and we need to. And what these task forces operationally come together is they is they is they um, is they can figure out all the different laws that and all the different tools that might apply that we can use again for the criminal networks that rise to U.S. national security interests and threats. And how do they do it? They work tactically, and tactically the work of these groups are to first and foremost to map all the networks and this is what we found uh, from a military perspective this is what the military is very very good at to map all the all the people all the all the places all the phones all the organizations all the bank accounts into those wonderful spider web maps as people seen all those those great spider web maps that come out of these these analytical things if you haven't please go back get briefed on how these things uh, how these things work because it's a it's a it's a wonderful um, set of analytical tools that really take advantage of the explosion of data and data analysis that's just been available in the last 10 years um, that uh, that you can do it's amazing what Criminals put on social media that um, uh, that uh, that allow you to build out these these networks, um, but in order to map those networks in the first place, you need to have local cultural knowledge, and this is quite often where the United States government falls short, um, uh, and this is where we need help, and this is not intelligence as in secrets that need to be stolen. This is intelligence with a lowercase i. These are not secrets. There are many people around the world that know these facts, and we just don't know them, typically. Um, sometimes there are people in the U.S. government that actually do know it really well. They do know, you know, this tribe and this sub-tribe and all their history, and everything, but they're often not brought into these, um, uh, these operational cells. So that, that's really critical, is to have that local knowledge, local language skills. This is where the State Department is invaluable uh, in, um, uh, in all of these efforts. Um, after you have mapped these networks, if you really understand the, uh, the, the, the cultural and historical context for all of these, uh, for all of these networks, um, you know, in some places, you know, uh, like in the United States, family connections might not be important at all. You know, I'm not responsible for what my sister does. Maybe she's a criminal. I don't know, but it doesn't affect me. In other places, what your family member does is critically important to what, to what you do. And you got to know those those sort of those sort of dynamics in order to make those charts. But once you can map those networks, then you identify wh where are the nodes that if you if you disrupt or destroy that node in the network, you have a disproportionate effect on that network that you've really hampered their capability to do work, so that you're not spending all your time going after low you know uh, uh, low level people that don't really have a strategic impact on it, but you're hitting the real nodes. You're hitting the Lebanese Canadian <laughs> banks that really disrupt an entire. Uh, an entire system and have wider political implications for the organization. Um, the uh, uh, you have to um, uh, uh, then you have to understand once you've figured out what the node is, what is the proper finish? 
in a very, very small number of circumstances, very small, the Department of Defense will be part of that finish. There are only a few, thankfully, a few countries in the world where we are going to kill somebody. Um, but sometimes that, that, will be, that will be the case, or capture someone. In most cases, the finish is a law enforcement finish, either by the United States or by the host country itself or by our vetted unit that goes out. Uh, it can be a diplomatic um, uh, finish where we, um, where we need to talk to the top people in the government in order to do it. It can be a sanctions uh, finish where we're doing an economic uh, or finance um, uh, action against them. But the, but the key thing is which one of those, once you've identified the node, is going to have the biggest impact. Um, and, and so, again, where the, as far as the military goes, finish sometimes, but the vast majority of our effort is about support is about support to civilian authorities, is about support in analytics, support in uh, targeting, support um, in intelligence and finding and fixing uh, with, with Department of Defense assets, support in training uh, through multilateral um, efforts and bilateral efforts, uh, uh, both in terms of you know direct training for building vetted units, but even wider training about uh, cultural and and, uh, and institutional uh, development, and it has the military efforts have to be in the context of a whole of government approach. Um, and most of the time, again, except for in those small instances where we have the finish, the leader of that in, of that interagency approach is not going to be somebody with a you know, military uniform; is going to be a civilian. Um, and that's critical for the Department of Defense to understand, accept, and, uh, and adapt to. Um, that's what I really wanted to kick off and talk about our, our, uh, at, at the beginning, but happy to now turn this into more of a conversation for the, for the uh, time that we have left.